discussion, enabling venture ecosystems in uh, South and Southeast Asia. So as many of you know, uh, uh, Sankalp and IntelliCap have been looking at uh, expanding outside of India and looking at the uh, social enterprise and impact investing landscape outside of India. And uh, as part of that initiative, uh, uh, we're hosting this panel. And we're very fortunate to have with us a very esteemed uh, set of speakers from uh, who have traveled here, especially uh, for, this, uh, for this event. And I'd just like to quickly introduce them as well as the moderator. Uh, so first we have Mr. Asif Saleh from BRAC. Uh, Asif is uh, 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 working for one of the most uh, well-known uh, social enterprises out there. Uh, most people will be familiar Thanks. with the work of BRAC. Uh, uh, based in Bangladesh and now having a presence across uh, many, many countries and uh, it's, I think, now almost completely self-funded. So maybe Asif can tell us a bit more about the experience of BRAC. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Mrs. Bela Raza Jamil uh, joining us from Pakistan. Uh, Bela is uh, a name which is well, well recognized in the education uh, sector in Pakistan, uh, both in primary education as well as vocational training. She's the founder of a civil society organization called uh, ITI, and also, uh, also the director of uh, Sanjay Nagar School, and uh, we're very lucky to have her as well to share her experience. Uh, our third panelist is Mr. Doug Clayton. Uh, Doug uh, is a former banker from Wall Street who now runs uh, a frontier markets uh, investment firm called Leopard Capital, uh, which does both for-profit as well as uh, social enterprise impact investing. Uh, in different frontier markets, including Cambodia and Haiti. And finally, we have Mrs. Uh, Sato Kokono uh, from Arun LLC in uh, Japan. Arun is, uh, Arun is a impact investing organization comprised of family offices in Japan, uh, which also has done some work in Southeast Asia, and now they're looking at uh, doing some work in India. So we're very fortunate to have these four panelists. Thank you all for very much for joining us. And finally, to introduce the moderator, uh, Mr. Ian Venkat uh, is a partner at Avishkar, and specifically at uh, Avishkar Frontier Fund, which is uh, an attempt by Avishkar to start looking outside India in markets like uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, I'll just hand it over to Venkat so we can kick off the panel. Please welcome our panelists. Uh, as uh, Kartik said, this has uh, been an uh, interesting effort for us to put together a panel uh, which has a, such a diverse experience uh, beyond India. And uh, because, as you know, Sankalp uh, has a uh, lot of experiences which uh, are focused on India. And we thought that we would take this initiative to expand uh, beyond India and then look at uh, uh, what should I say, the markets outside and what people are doing. Uh, the <coughs> Just as uh, 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 structure of the session, I think we'll have about a half an hour discussion, and then maybe then we'll throw it up uh, for uh, questions. Uh, I would like to start um, uh, with uh, Asif. To uh, Asif, uh, uh, BRAC has been an organization which all of us have admired, uh, which has uh, done two, three things which uh, uh, all of us have been talking about. A, one is scale. Uh, I think. BRAC has been an organization which has been able to scale uh, not only in a particular uh, core sector, let's say microfinance or uh, education or any of the issues dealing with the poorest of the poor, but also been able to go beyond uh, Bangladesh itself. Uh, could you share some light on uh, how you, uh, what should you say, achieve this scale as well as what prompted you to go beyond your border? Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Two years ago, there was an article that came out uh, with the, in uh, Wired magazine, which had the headline, BRAC is the world's largest NGO, and it's a secret. So not, not, not many people actually, uh, outside the development sector, not many people know about it. But we, BRAC grew very quietly under the radar. Um, just to kind of give a little bit of idea about kind of how it started and what BRAC does right now. Let me set that up, and then I'll go into a bit of a kind of a, some of the insights. So BRAC originally started as a very small relief effort after the liberation war in 1971. That was 40 year, 42 years ago. And uh, now BRAC actually has, if in Bangladesh, uh, for example, over a turn, turnover of close to a billion dollar over uh, for the year. 
It has about 16 social enterprises. Uh, it has 10 very large scale development <coughs> programs around microfinance, education, uh, legal aid, healthcare. So we have about 100,000 healthcare, community healthcare volunteers. We run the largest uh, private secular school system in Bangladesh with about close to 37,000 schools. Uh, we learned the largest legal aid uh, uh, sort of support outside government as well. And uh, we have a bank, we have an insurance company, we have a uh, university. <laughs> so this is, it's, uh, we have the fastest growing mobile banking company in the world right now as well. So it's, uh, we, uh, after the government in Bangladesh, is the largest employer in Bangladesh as well. So uh, over about 55,000 full-time staff. Uh, about, uh, again, about 40,000 school teachers, and as I mentioned, that about 100,000 community health workers. So about 200,000 altogether, and that's just the NGO itself. Then we, uh, in terms of the international, op we are, we in, about 10 years ago, we went international. We are operating in about 11 countries right now with about 4,000 staff, and uh, that's BRAC International. And uh, so, so that's, you can imagine that, you know, the, all, the operate, all, all the programs are actually operating in large scale. Now, how did it happen? How did that, from a tiny relief effort to where BRAC is now? Um, I think uh, that's an interesting story. But if, but what I have followed and what I have, our founder is still um, kind of the chairperson of the organization. But it's been um, very interesting uh, in terms of how it looked at so uh, as you know, a lot of, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are kind of social entrepreneurs, kind of starting up. Uh, I myself one was before I kind of gave up. Uh, and you guys are struggling, I'm sure. But it's, I understand how difficult it, uh, it can be. But what, what in the history of BRAC, what I've seen is the three core elements that they have always done. One was that from very early days, the founder of the organization has very, very ambitious and lofty goals. He came from private sector at the age of 38. He decided that he was going to come back to Bangladesh from London. He was a senior executive at Shell Oil Company. He was very good with numbers. Um, but then he came in and then he started that I'm going to start this uh, organization. But I'm going to, in a resource constrained country like Bangladesh, you can do small things. It can be beautiful and it can be perfect. But in a country like Bangladesh, to have a major impact, you have to do it in scale. So from very early days, he was very ambitious that whatever he does, he's going to do it in scale. So he kept that mindset in mind so, and waited for the big opportunity. And when the opportunity came, he actually kind of set up infrastructure so that in future, when he does other programs at scale, it actually helps the infra infrastructure. And I'll get, get down to some details later on when I get the opportunity. The second point is that BRAC has always been very strategically um, before, like about five years ago, BRAC first done, did its strategy. They didn't have any strategy. So, so I asked our chairperson, what was the strategy? So he said the <laughs> strategy was to be opportunistic. So it was strategically opportunistic in a sense that BRAC always thought that poverty is a multidimensional problem. So you have to, there's no one single solution. So you have to attack it from all fronts. You start with microfinance. Uh, where financing is, everybody is, uh, touches that, everybody needs that. But then you get into the details of the social issues. What are those issues? And you position yourself so that whether it's funding opportunities, whether you, how you're communicating the problem, that you have a bigger vision of the, how you're gonna solve the structural problem. If you can communicate that, then mobilization, funding, those are not gonna be impossible. So that's, that's, that's what BRAC was very successfully able to mobilize. And the third one was, like I was saying, that very keen social awareness of the problems that, the, that Brack realized from a very early days that all issues are connected. And when you try to solve one problem, you do not get boxed into that how you're going to solve. You have to solve it in this way or that way, like a, the, typically the way NGOs or enterprise operates. Um, you basically try any innovative method. You can be a disruptor. I mean. 30 years ago, yeah, I mean, basically when BRAC started microfinance, the, the genesis of these enterprises are quite fascinating because it didn't start as a, like, I'm going to start a social enterprise. 30 years ago, there was no concept of social enterprise. It came in as a support for the devel economic development program. 
So imagine uh, basically the rural area where there's no economic activity going on. So you start the microfinance effort. So you start giving money to people's hand, and they start economic activities. So they, some, some are artisans, some buy chickens, some buy cows. So they produce milk. So they have to sell these milks. Where do they sell that? There are not enough buyers. The poultry, poultry, for example, they need vaccination. They need feeds. So where is it going to come from? So BRAC looked at these issues, and then basically it looked at the, so saw that you know, there's a market failure there. Took an ecosystem approach. Absolutely. And so then basically BRAC, some of these enterprises came out of that. So it created that supply chain to do the BRAC dairy. It created a feed mill to su support the poultry. So a lot of these enterprises actually started as a kind of creating that supply chain to address those market failures and eventually became very profitable. Why did you do it all yourself and why not let the market forces operate and you leverage it rather than you do it yourself? That happened uh, because no market force at, was, at that time was willing to come. I mean, the private sector was not going to come because there was, in the poultry sector, for example, there was no private sector would come because there's nobody to vaccinate. There's nobody, no good feed meals out there. So, so when BRAC went in, they had to actually create these things in the larger ecosystem. They actually trained these community people on vaccination, they had to train, educate them on good quality feed. So there's a lot of work on the ecosystem had to be done, which prepared the private sector. Then private sector, then everything was built in. So now you can go in. There's a lot less. Private sector didn't want to take that chance at that time because there was going to be just too much investment that had to be made. So once it was made, then now poultry has been taken over by the private sector, big time. But by that time they first got in, they, I mean, the ecosystem BRAC had to invest on. So I think that was one of the key, key third lessons that you actually have to look at problems in a way which is the ecosystem way. Uh, just to take on from there, uh, Bela, you have done a lot of work in Pakistan. Uh, the economic context which uh, I think uh, uh, which Pakistan and Bangladesh uh, were created uh, is, I guess, quite familiar to all of us. How do you see this political and economic context influencing uh, the way in which you see social enterprises developing in Pakistan? and? What's been your experience in, uh, what you say, developing social enterprises in Pakistan? Um, well, I think that um, has a very, very important role to play. But, you know, just to give a sense of, you know, the 185 million uh, people and in terms of 22% of poverty officially defined, but generally vulnerability equal number, so about another 22% in and out of poverty all the time, uh, a very volatile situation both in country and geopolitically um, for Pakistan over a long period of time means that people have to find spaces in which they can be enterprising. Now we are all from the same gene pool in this entire region and obviously the spirit of enterprise is very much alive and kicking and hence you have uh, the phenomena of almost 80% uh, of the economy in the informal sector. So the informal sector is, you know, absolutely roaring. Um, you have uh, people who are looking for ways of being enterprising all the time against all, all odds. Uh, since 2005, we've also had sustained periods of emergencies. And, and of course, because of the Afghan war and so on, the displacements, both internal and the Afghan population, which is still about 3 million in the country, um, is, is, is huge. Uh, so in that, uh, and the, the political situation in terms of governments, um, you know, we have this uh, game be between uh, dictatorship and democracy. Luckily, we've got now second period of sustained democracy, and many good things have happened. But at the same time, the challenges, as we were hearing this morning also, to the ordinary citizen are phenomenal. So. Um, the citizen is constantly looking for ways and means to address um, uh, their, their urgent needs, whether it's housing, whether it's food security, whether it's education or health. In education itself, and I don't know how many people know that, but almost 40% of our education overall um, is uh, being supported uh, by the private sector. Um, and in that, if you look at the urban-rural divide, you have almost 27% um, private sector in rural areas and 60% in urban areas. Interestingly, it's very similar patterns between India and Pakistan. Bangladesh is different because the state aided 
private sector is almost 94 percent at the secondary level. Uh, so Pakistan in that sense is different, but private sector definitely on the rise and urbanization 36 percent poised to go up to 40 percent by 2020. Now in this scenario um, where you have to be able to sit and find spaces for conversations on development, education, enterprise, um, they are, have also been opportunities after the Ziaul Haq period from the 90s onwards, a lot of civil society um, movement, you know, which has been on the rise. And of course, the civil society itself is not of, you know, it's a kind of a continuum. So you have civil society as a pure not-for-profit not, not to emerging civil society, which is also for-profit and looking at entrepreneurship in different ways. But certainly they have negotiated these spaces between those people who feel completely disenfranchised to the, to the, to the few you know, who, to whom it, all these issues don't matter. But also playing the intermediaries between the government. The government has successfully, even under demo, uh, democratic setup, the governments have not been able to come up to the expectations of the people. So in a certain extent, you're saying that because the government uh, wasn't responding, that's when uh, you, uh, you saw Pakistan's social enterprises developing. Yes, developing and also another aspect where Pakistan has got some of the best examples of public-private partnerships, where the government has, uh, you know, we've knocked on doors and the government has embraced and some, of course, have critiqued it as the role back of the state, uh, that the state is quite happy to give space to other partners to come and become players, like the current Nawaz Sharif government is almost, you know, uh, literally creating as much of an enabling environment as possible for enterprise, for <coughs> better relationships with neighboring countries and so on, amidst all the other mixed signals that people get. So with 130 media channels out there, and so on. Can you imagine? And Pakistan has got the fifth largest, it's the fifth largest user of mobile phones. I don't know how many people know that. But can you imagine with technologies generally working very well, infrastructure in good shape, um, people, you know, on the march, uh, and uh, many, many players coming in to perform this intermediation role uh, with the government and the government taking it as part of their not here the five-year planning process but the 2025 vision and the sector plans in education or health as an open call to public-private partnerships and saying yes the government cannot be the provider and will be very happy to play the role of a financier now you know so it, in that sense it's a very interesting environment but it becomes difficult for people who really don't have a certain level of education or access to opportunities. And so uh, it means that somebody else has to come in between to be able to take this um, uh, effort to the next stage. I will share with you some of the things that have come up that you create a small enabling platform and you see the response, which is quite phenomenal. But then uh, I'll just end this segment by sharing that uh, we, have, we are a federation which doesn't work very well, and we have a lot of inequities across all pro provinces. So obviously, then somebody has to play a role of addressing issues of inequities from one province to another. So if Punjab gets, you know, fantastically uh, well developed, and then Balochistan is not, or Sindh rural looks, you know, completely out in the cold, worse than Fata, by the way, and sometimes worse than Balochistan you have a big worry on your hand. If the government is not worried, the society is. Uh, Satoko san, uh, as we have seen in Pakistan, I guess it was the role of the government and its uh, stated intention of uh, what you say, inviting the private sector or uh, its inability to meet up to the demands. When you looked at Cambodia, how did you decide to go to Cambodia? Was it this kind of a context which led you to go to uh, Cambodia or was it something else which, uh, could you share your thoughts on that? Thank you. Um, yes, um, if you know the history of Cambodia, I'm sure you do. Um, it was like 20 years ago, they uh, opened up the country and they democratized. First election was after the war was 1993. And I went there in 1995, so it was just after that time. And then the, the 
the new economy, new government, uh, new hope for people. And but of course, after the war, after the the um, separation from the Western world, they need lots of support. So all the supports coming in to Cambodia, just influx of. If you imagine Myanmar today, maybe you can think of it. So I was part of that kind of a movement. I was an uh, NGO worker, then uh, moved to uh, government ODA aid. Uh, so I was there for 10 years working with, uh, with the development assistance. And country changed a lot. And during that time, um, um, country developed, but at the same time, country where we really enjoyed uh, the support from outside. This morning, somebody was saying that the, the, the reason of persistence of poverty was mindset. And she said that uh, if one leaves, then another one will come. Another one leaves, another one will come. And that kind of expectation um, is there. And so I was getting tired of it. Many people are getting tired of it. And Arun started because there is a voice from the Cambodian entrepreneur that, that they would like to build their future on their own. They don't want to depend on the aid, and they would like to find a sustainable way. To what do you think triggered the entrepreneurs to come up with this feeling to say that uh, uh, they needed to do market forces to operate rather than mm. aid? Good question. Um, actually, the, the, the organization I was referring to, I used to think that uh, that uh, NGO could be a black in Cambodia. The, <laughs> the NGO was working with farmers and rural area. Um, they covered whole provinces and attracted the farmers to, to work together. And uh, the, the leader challenged the farmers that uh, this is your development, up to you. So don't, uh, don't rely on. And then some farmers respond to, some farmers didn't like. But some respond to, and then they, 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 they uh, persist, and they, they, they move on. Then these farmers are no longer depending on the aid. They are looking at their, they are um, increasing their production. Um, they are ready to, they are, they're enough to eat, and then they're ready to sell. And then they, they look for the market. Then they are no longer um, you dependent, know, on aid. Um, dependent on aid. Um, and some of, the, some of the farmers, they, they created the farmers association and then they work well and then some of them have uh, the idea of going on their own. But then some of them try to, try to value the community they created, supported by the aid, and then try to build on it. Then NGOs need to do something with that, not only the traditional type of support, but then to connect with the market, to be benefit to the farmers, and to then that motivate, I think, to change the NGOs' mindset. And then and the aid structure is not fit to that kind of need. So they, they wanted to, they asked for investment. And uh, actually, they asked um, us to, to find an investor in Japan. And that's, that's exactly the, the time that we start thinking of the investment, kind of social investment, that uh, the needs are there. So the entrepreneur themselves approached us to, to find a way. And then so we- What you're saying is as the markets are developing, mm. they are evolving in their role of understanding of financial capital. Mm, mm, mm. I think like so. Now come to Doug, uh, has that been your experience as well, where you saw capital was trying to look at these kind of opportunities because you are in Wall Street and uh, you are looking at a wide range of across the world investing. How did you choose to uh, look at emerging markets like Cambodia or Haiti or? Uh... Okay, well, actually, I spent most of my career in Thailand. I moved in the 1980s when it was a frontier market, and I was in investing in the public markets there and watched the economy grow from a frontier market to a middle income country. Um, seven years ago, I. I um, thought I could repeat that experience by moving my family to Cambodia and trying to launch the first investment fund in Cambodia, which turned out to be difficult timing because the financial crisis ensued when I was mm. fundraising. But I managed to get 107 investors to collectively give me $34 million. And we've invested in 14 businesses in Cambodia. Um, at the time, I didn't know what impact investing was.
but after we invested the portfolio, it appeared that a lot of our businesses that we chose for financial reasons were actually quite impactful. A, a microfinance institution, a rural bank, a power grid in a rural area, and many, many uh, companies that created jobs. So uh, I, I became interested in, in whether our approach um, could also be uh, blended with a, an impact approach. Um, we chose deliberately to move out of our region for our second fund to the Caribbean because it was as far away as we could imagine. We wanted to see whether we could be effective there and whether we could learn anything that we could bring back to Asia or bring ideas from Asia there. <coughs> and so what's your experience in that? So we created an impact fund um, in Haiti, which is the poorest country in, in the American hemisphere. Um, we raised $20 million from some development banks and um, we, we screened the investments for impact first, but then chose them on, on financial merits after that. And we, we found out of that that we really enjoyed the impact investments more than just a, a, a regular investment. It was just more exciting to be tackling development challenges. And uh, I think going forward, we're going to uh, embed impact investing into our, our strategies. Uh, but what we learned is not really that different. But you know, managing an impact company or a non-impact company, it's still the same rigor, the, the due diligence, the, uh, the, the operational uh, supervision, and the accounting. And it's not that different. It's just that um, you know, your one company has a slightly different orientation, but we still push them to be profitable. We think the way to grow the impact space is to show mainstream investors that this is actually a good place to make money, because there's a lot more mainstream capital than there is philanthropic capital. In, uh, when you decided to go international, they, they decided to go international because they thought it was uh, as profitable as uh, mainstream. Was that the similar reason why BRAC decided to go international? So when, I mean, BRAC is credited to have a transformational impact in the Bangladesh rural space. So, uh, so a lot of our donors basically asked us to, uh, yeah, asked us to kind of go international for a long time, but we had resisted it. But the idea was that uh, can we take some of the learnings, what changed the rural development in Bangladesh, abroad, and, and particularly in post-conflict countries. So, so, so after the post-Afghanistan war, so there was an opportunity to do that in Afghanistan. And so we went to Afghanistan as the first country of operation to take some of the learnings and see. But of course, yes, so that's, that's the war the, period or after or? the war, after the war. So we started our operation in 2003 okay. over there. Uh, so started very small, but over the time of the space, now it's the largest NGO in Afghanistan as well. But, uh, but, 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 but essentially, l there was a lot of learning. It wasn't a success story right away. Uh, that, uh, and the critical learning that you cannot just take one model and apply it there. Mm. I mean, I'll give you the example of the microfinance. We do not run the microfinance operation anymore in, Bra in Afghanistan. Okay. And, um, and why is that? Because the way it operated in Bangladesh, it's a more of a, like a, it was a village organization model that you actually gather a group of women. Social and then collateral. Social collateral, yeah, absolutely. So you basically and, and do your activities around this group. So we tried to take that model in Afghanistan, but that didn't work because of the geographical location, the density of population, everything is different. Uh, in Bangladesh, all these houses are very closely interlinked. Uh, in Afghanistan, that's not the case. There is the social issues uh, of women getting loans. There is the religious context. It's a much more conservative uh, country than Bangladesh. Is. So, all of these made our, uh, and, and we also directly implemented our, our operations. So we kind of expanded quite fast all across uh, Afghanistan. But uh, so it wasn't yeah, a Bangladesh really people going to Afghanistan, or you trained the local people to? Yeah, so initially, a uh, lot of the Bangladeshi staff went there, but the goal was always to convert it in a, as an Afghan organization, nationalize the organization. So 95% of our staff are Afghans. I mean, same in, in Pakistan and same in other countries we operate, that we are just a very few initially who goes there and train people up in Bangladesh and they come back. And then you actually build the national capacity there. But I think that has been a fundamental uh, learning that, and there are a lot of interesting innovations that are happening 
in these countries. I mean, some of the programs, very similar programs that ran in um, sort of in Bangladesh, ran very differently in Uganda, very differently in South Sudan. But the basic context of which is what Brack's theory of, of change is that there is strength in community. There, so you need to use the power of community, and you need to provide various access uh, to systems, to market, to finance, you know, so that the people themselves can be the agent of change. So when you say the strength in the community, do you see that reflected in the government, or do you see that reflected in uh, organizations which are not necessarily government uh, uh, controlled or regulated? No, I think uh, basically government plays its role, but I think the role, the way the our interventions are designed, that it's not like a, like a fly-by-night, like uh, NGO workers coming in and changing your system. It's, it's very much around that community the organizing. community workers uh, are going to be trained. And so that even if BRAC is not there, so there is inherent capacity that has been built. Some systemic changes has been put in place so that they can be the agent of change themselves. So that's the basic notion. So for example, our schools. So these are uh, taught by teachers of the community women, SSC, like you know, high school graduates, who are not uh, otherwise would not get a job anywhere else. They were housewives, but they were community. Uh, they were they have certain presence in the community and they have certain affinity towards the community. And when they get trained, so their sort of the way they work is a lot different and personal from the way if I had highly trained teacher go up from the capital and go over there and train them. In uh, Pakistan, since you've worked, both of you have worked in the education sector, would your strategy have been different from the one which uh, BRAC had followed in the education sector? Oh well, yes. I mean, you know, BRAC was as, uh, had its origins in an emergency. And I think, uh, as um, he shared, that the chairman felt one had to be opportunistic and, you know, uh, take uh, wherever, whatever spaces were there to do that. Similarly, in Pakistan, of course, there were very different. It was education was always in a silent emergency. People like us who returned to Pakistan after 20 years of being outside and you know cribbing always that it should have been done this way or that way decided you know I'm like in our case we decided in 2000 that uh, one and a half people got together and said okay let's walk the talk and let's start improving government schools because they were completely run down and in shambles and can we through public private partnerships begin to demonstrate what we think should happen in public sector public sector needs to reclaim some of the integrity um, of the learning um, solutions and we feel that children must have their fundamental right at that stage of course education had not been declared as a fundamental right in the constitution as it has been done in 2010 so you know our journey started with school improvement programs through partnerships uh, in public sector facilities and then we decided for 10 years we'll do nothing but work with the public sector what it did do though was to uh, deepen that uh, relationship building with public sector um, are, uh, you know, the courage to be innovative for the government to say, all right, if this organization is coming, we can shut our eyes and know that things are not going to, they're not the Kabza group, they're not going to go and take over our um, so facilities. So capacity building approach, whereas they took an approach of delivering the service. Yeah, no, the no, no, no. Out? So it was both. So we took on the school completely. So the management, delivery service, service delivery, that. capacity building, but also using that, since I had a public policy uh, training so public policy was a very big part of my work at the same time I became technical advisor to the ministry so we were using synergies all the time also being opportunistic but soon realizing that actually there's a large non-state sector out there and uh, putting all the eggs in one basket is not a sensible thing to do so gradually the work uh, expanded from just public sector work to non-state partners starting the services of school improvement and school assessment, or doing school assessment first and then doing improvements, but also trying to help scale up some of the schools such as Sanjanagar, which had become a model which looked quite sustainable to scale it up further, and then entering the technical vocational sector also on public sector sites. Now, this kind of work, the government, you know, government itself, um, you know, uh, loves it because uh, we are sharing how you can optimize a public sector service, but also creating a marketplace which had never been done before to 
put all the service providers and solution providers, including financial institutions, there to see, okay, what can you do? And it's very interesting that the public sector itself is looking at these financial institutions in a different way altogether. And we are now amending the act of the public-private partnership, which was very infrastructure oriented, to see if they can include services and government can become a, a not just a co-sharer in the financial risks, but also in the performance risk as well. So these are real shifts which are taking place. We've been at the center of it all. But in that, we are creating synergies which are at the national, regional, and global levels. We are working with very large scale programs such as Asar Pakistan, Right to Education, where we engage with youth, media, judiciary, teacher unions, and similarly also trying to bring the policy makers from the public sector, looking at private sector uh, providers and people who are in the, in the financial space, as well as the development partners and advisors all on the same table. So this brokering role the trying to look at synergies across sectors and trying to, and being very opportunistic also, but it's now suddenly put us in a slightly different role where we feel, okay, now we can look at possibilities of not, not just doing enterprise, but also scaling up that enterprise through some kind of financial inclusion services. Doug, how do you see this uh, markets playing a role in the way they have come from an approach of taking uh, service delivery and then scaling it up into public policy and then a market creation role. How have you seen in your experience this market creation role via the financial systems and uh, the kind of role that they play in portfolio selection and portfolio creation? I, mean, I think one difference with um, Cambodia is it's a very private sector driven economy. Um, the, the government is not expected to be very supportive except small for government. Way. Small low government. government, low taxes, low regulation. So it's really up to the private sector, especially the foreign investors who have built most of the economy. Um, but they give a very open uh, playing field for foreign investors. Um, so I, I think one point I want to make here to the entrepreneurs in the room uh, is that a lot of the best innovation that I'm seeing is coming here in India uh, for the social enterprises. Many of you have great ideas that are needed outside of India as well countries like Cambodia that don't have the human capital to develop such innovations, um, but are very fertile environments to transplant your business ideas. So I, I want to encourage you to, um, to look beyond your borders if you have a good uh, solution and try to partner up with people in some other countries that would really be able to utilize your, uh, your knowledge. And if I can add one thing, I mean, the other, other thing I would say is also that one of the things Bragg did the whole BOP market approach I, I see now is where poor people are looked at as just consumers of the products. But Brack kind of looked at not just consumers but as producers of the products, right? So from the artisans to the dairies yes. to all of these. So I think that's very crucial because when you look at, look at it like that, so they, you are actually, whether it's creating employment, whether that's changing their lives and you actually are giving them the ladder to not only improve their lives, but at the same time, uh, at the uh, large scale, the whole scale, change. absolutely. Yeah. I also wanted to add that in Pakistan, the government in the 90s decided to create what we call gongos. So these were government uh, organized NGOs, and the government created endowment fund, taking its inspiration from the Akhan Rural Support Program. They created the NR National mm -hmm. Rural Support Programs, and in each province is another support, and the poverty, Pakistan Poverty Alleviation Fund. Uh, so what it did do was, on the one hand, this was sort of a government-sponsored anti-poverty programs, um, and uh, which went into uh, several uh, social sectors, but at the same time created somehow a comfort level that funds will keep on coming from mm -hmm. somewhere. Now, somewhere uh, that relationship of the uh, producers, consumers, uh, got some, sometimes got disconnected, depending how much fund the World Bank put in, or DFID put in, or whatever, or the government itself put in from time to time. So, and some of uh, the other organizations in civil society and private sector felt that they have an unfair advantage, because for every um, government program where they want to look for a civil society initiative, they end up preferring the gongos over others. 
And sometimes they become very inertia ridden. And some of the employees who are in the gongos are the failed bureaucrats who never did anything them when they were in the government. How would they become more productive? And that formulation did not quite convince many of us. Um, and so therefore, you know, there has been uh, quite a response to many organizations now, you know, wanting to take that initiative of enterprise further and looking at uh, many out of the box solutions and innovations. I'd just like to ask one question to all of you. How do you see the role of technology playing in, uh, what should we say, the way you have developed uh, seeing your marketplace and uh, what should we say, how you believe that this is the scope of your effort and this is the scope where the market plays in? Start before, before going to the technology thing, um, I agree with you that uh, we really um, um, enjoy coming here to see the diversity mm. and uh, the dynamic of the entrepreneurs coming up and interacting with each other. Um, having said that, um, coming from Japan, looking at the um, enterprise environment in Cambodia. Sorry. Um, having said that, um, coming from Japan, looking at uh, enterprise and entrepreneurs' environment in Cambodia, I think we we uh, looking the the market from really special perspective because because of the, those entrepreneurs are looking for kind of two goals like both financial return and social return. In that sense, I think it's more difficult than the, the commercial businesses. And that pursuit and that struggle, and given that low ecosystem or whatever, low technology or whatever, the entrepreneurs are fighting and uh, trying and um, doing a new uh, trial that inspire people in Japan to, to really think about our own programs. And that's how we see that uh, the importance of the um, dialogue. yeah trans trans border or the dialogue and uh, I think <coughs> Japanese investors are getting like uh, slowly like community to be aware of and to create or to join this this movement and I think that's the that's the key to to utilize the uh, the different uh, elements. Like to comment on. Uh, I just want to touch on the technology question. I think we're all really lucky to be alive today when there's so many new technologies that were not available decades ago, and we can use these in in um, impoverished areas to give people a leapfrog ahead to um, to a much more modern life. And I, I see the, the the ideas that are coming to us, particularly in Haiti, which is very close to the U.S. and it sort of absorbs some of the technological ideas in the US. Um, it, it's really exciting that, that um, you can attack things that I don't know how we would have done it 30 years ago without these technologies. Yeah, I mean, I would uh, echo that. I mean, it's a very exciting time to do it to be, uh, for technology enthusiasts. But in the social space, I think uh, there's a lot of hype about it. But at the same time, you need to look at the larger space and how you know, technology is always an enabler, as you know. But so you need to see really how it fits in, rather than thinking uh, that it's just going to solve the problem by itself. So or too often we just think about that particular application and get very excited about it. But how it fits into the larger system is now we miss it. But the more exciting part is, I think, where technologies directly can help the social sector is uh, on on data. I think we held a Frigal Innovation Forum last week in Bangladesh, where we looked at how data can be used for social good. So mobile phone right now, the smartphones we have, actually have the same computing power that the 1969, the moon, the rocket that went to the moon. So that's, that's powerful, more than that, okay. So that's, that's very, very powerful. So you, that has made capturing data very easy. So analyzing and also visualizing the data. So I think when you lay, out, lay it out, at, out sort of, we actually do the hard work of collecting the data on household, but analyzing and visualizing makes a lot of difference in terms of how you design your future interventions, how you do real-time monitoring of your interventions. 
So that's a very, very exciting space for policymakers, for NGOs, social sectors. I think which is can more and more people are getting excited about it. The agency which manages all the ID cards and all of did a fantastic thing. It just SMS to every every citizen, voter the where they were supposed to go and vote their particular number. Now that meant the voter turnout was amazing and across all ages because people thought only young people would go out. Well, people you know as uh, as old as in their 80s and 90s, some on stretchers, and I'm an eyewitness account of that. Uh, so it was really wonderful to see from very something a very simple solution what it did in terms of enfranchising people who didn't have to ask the feudal lord who to vote. Nobody knew actually where they would go and whatever. So in that sense, it was a very interesting thing how it addressed issues, social barriers, economic barriers, overcame them. Similarly now, uh, from the government side, they are very hot on technologies. They are even using tablets, for example, in Punjab for their monitoring and also for um, teachers and training and so on. So, so, and, you know, and so equipping high schools or middle schools and so on. But generally speaking, in terms of learning solutions, we have had um, a very exciting innovations uh, in Pakistan come up, whether it is the Khan Academy inspiration and many versions of that and so on, how it can get to schools. Many organizations have just proliferated. But I still think that it's such a pity and, you know, coming here and because we work a lot with India as an organization and with South Asia, because I'm also the coordinator of the South Asia Forum for Education Development, it, it's a pity that we do not exchange this sort of learning forum uh, quite sufficiently. We should have many more of such forums, you know, across South Asia, where many people come together and God knows what that power is going to be. And just, you know, even within our institution, if we look at um, two big things, which is the Asar in Pakistan, 10,000 volunteers, all districts are covered, 16 days, 16 weeks from the time of survey, to the report coming out and being disseminated, we use technology enormously, not just to be able to collect data, process it, and give it out, but also the dissemination function. So um, we've seen that, and also in the children's literature and the teacher literature festivals that we do, which are again across country, and in that uh, we are using that, you know, in that very fun way of how the social media and the new media can uh, be used uh, inside the classrooms. Getting teachers to get over their fear of using this. So the users are multiple, as I shared with you. Uh, mobile telephony is phenomenal, branchless banking, in banking solutions also. Um, it's, it's just catching up. The entire Benazir income support or the social safety net programs is precisely through that. So you know, you see the penetration very deep, but perhaps the opportunities have not been totally explored. Um, we'd love to see a much bigger, uh, a wider terrain in South Asia, a wider net of these technologies, because I think that's really where the underexplored uh, potential lies. With this, I think you have seen that uh, there have been diverse experiences of Haiti, Cambodia, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. And as you can see, the forces which have been driving their strategies uh, beyond capital has been the power of networks, the power of technology the power of markets, and the power of cultural understanding of how you shape your thing. That I'd like to open it to the floor. And if there are any questions you'd like to ask the panelists, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to respond to the same. I don't know about the regional yet, because I think individual countries uh, uh, have not figured it out as yet. So regional will probably come as the next step. But, uh, but I think, uh, for example, I, I have been very excited to see what's, what has sunk up forum. I mean, 
kind of it's an exciting space just to be. You can feel the energy. All of you are such powerful change makers who are trying to make a difference. Uh, we don't have that in Bangladesh. We don't have this yet in Bangladesh, but I think it's, I don't know about Pakistan, but I think just I see a lot of these players in this space, whether it's the funders, whether it's the raters, mm. who are the evaluators, uh, and then, then you need also the pipeline of projects to invest in. Uh, so I think once people hear and see some of the success stories, and then that will get people really excited to do their something their own as well. I think uh, when I moved back to Bangladesh, the one thing one person told me that the best thing you can do there is can match make people. Because <laughs> a lot of times, people just don't have access to information, just don't know who to talk to, who to, mm. who to. A lot of good initiatives fail because of that. And you, uh, in, on these kinds of forums attracts people of a certain kind, people who can communicate well, who can, and we were just talking about it last night, but there are a lot of powerful, hardcore entrepreneurs, incubators, just because they don't have those soft skills, they cannot, they, they don't, they can access this. But they need that system as well, where they, I mean, they are very, very um, solid uh, entrepreneurs as well. So that's where the ecosystem comes in. So people know that there's a system in place. You can go, you can pitch, you can get funded, get ideas are here heard about. So how you can create that Silicon Valley uh, for social entrepreneurship here. I think that's what individual countries are struggling with, but I'm sure we'll be there. But I think then a regional space is much more likelihood. But, but in terms of ideas and stuff, that of course can, doesn't need boundaries. I mean, I think a lot of like, the, some of the ideas because that I heard, exactly, those can, be, those can be incorporated very quickly other places. Asar, for example, started in India. Now it is going on in nine. That's a very low tech solution, yeah. but very simple solution. But scales like that. So we actually had Asar come over in Bangladesh last week, and we are likely to do that in Bangladesh from next year as well. So. I see the importance of the, the basics. Um, like when, when, when we are working with the Cambodian entrepreneurs, um, they are great with the vision, with the business model, their network, and they, they build up what they have been doing. But then sometimes they have simple financials, they fail, or sometimes they even don't know whether they are making money or losing money. I mean, you may laugh, you may think that it's too low level, but I, I'm not so sure because we start talking with an Indian entrepreneur and then uh, they are great. But then when we come close to them, they, they might say that, uh, well, um, we have some weakness in financials. So, so there are some similarities I could see and that needs to be like tackled in more systematic way. The, the startup entrepreneurs were covered like startup wave and all those things, and that is necessary. But then I think some entrepreneur who has a certain level but still need kind of solid financial or business skills or development, constant development, and need to have kind of systematic approach. And we are trying to build up these, uh, these uh, courses and uh, programs, but uh, I really would like to see the, you know, I, I see, I talk with a couple of people and they see the same needs, so maybe we could in line with this and then that kind of, you know, alliance or collaboration might be beneficial. I, I think, I think uh, just to quickly say, you know, for us, the Sweden SAC is a dead failure, I mean, in terms of that forum. Uh, forums like this, you know, can be very powerful, but in anything like that, such as the Asar work that we've done, you know, one, somebody has to be persistent, somebody has to take the leadership role, somebody has to be believer in that, somebody has to go beyond boundaries and beyond bureaucracy. Um, so, you know, it needs that kind of a force, leadership, uh, enterprise to bring people together. Um, I think civil, some civil society, private sector does have that, you know, they have the guts, they can persist. Uh, it's extremely doable. Um, 
just like we did Asar, we brought people from Lucknow, from India, and from Nepal. You know, they came to do the children's literature festival to see it. And within five, six weeks, they were taking ideas and running with it. So this is such a great forum. It's a celebration of ideas. It's a celebration of new instruments that have come up, of technology, of uh, things which are so doable. And so how do you create those corridors? It's not difficult. The biggest difficulty really resides here and here. You overcome those barriers. Taking the first step. And taking the first step to do this, for example, in Pakistan, or the region, including East Asia and others, is not difficult. And I think it will be very welcomed, and uh, you'll be amazed with how, pe how much people will enjoy this. So it's just taking that, becoming a belief, and running it. to um, emancipation of uh, endangered tribes in India. So uh, particularly in the Naxal uh, affected areas. So uh, the, the whole model is called Sarv Mangalam. Sarv Mangalam in Sanskrit, uh, it means uh, good for all. Now uh, what I do is I go into these areas, look out for these tribes, innovate in their art, make it you know modern, brand it, value it a you know, lot more, and sell it to Volvo you know, uh, and Bank of America, you know, big clients. Whatever money uh, I earn out of it, one third remains with my company. One third goes back to those artisans, and one third goes for, uh, you know, uh, children, you know, orphans, because orphans are our responsibility. We all could have been orphans, so I think the only people who need are orphans. So, so this particular model is 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 very inclusive. Now, I thought now the same thing could be uh, applied to you know countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Cambodia. We are all uh, from the same gene pool, as you said, but with the same emotions, but with different nationalities on our ID cards. That's all. So uh, I, when when that happened, now the same thought was you know striking again and again. Uh, I became friends with Sadia Akhtar. She is an RJ from Dil FM Islamabad. And uh, we, we, we were discussing about this model. Now she is implementing the same Sarv Mangla model in Lahore. Now that was through an informal medium of Facebook. Okay, but then intent was there, Mama. You said this and this. Now intent was there, but then you know, this was only one one very you know small example. But uh, for tomorrow, as she said, you know there have there has to be forum, you know a bigger forum of ideas, which which has a lot of credibility first, and a lot more freedom to talk about. It. You know, there, there, there should be no fear that, they, you know, if it worked for Pakistan, it can work for India and vice versa. So, so probably, you know, you as, you know, the flag bearers, you know, you may initiate something like that to, for tomorrow and, and, you know, make it, make it a possibility. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. was how India has some great innovations and you know there is a lot of scope of replicating it in some other countries. Uh, just a piece of information and then question. So DFID under one of its programs is planning to pick up some of the Indian innovations that have probably scaled in the country and check if you know in terms of replicability in other low income settings. So just look out for that through Millennium Alliance especially. My question really is having said that I've traveled extensively in South Asia, and the one thing that I see which is that there's very little integration. Very little integration. Intent, maybe yes, with a lot of, you know, with, with a lot of players, but I see very little integration. Just trying to understand if this is something that we want to do in terms of taking an Indian innovation to another low-income country, especially maybe South Asia. What, you know, what would you think would be a good model going partnering with the government, going there partnering with a civil society organization, going there on your own, going there partnering with another entrepreneur? No, I, I can be, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm going to assume it's demand driven. Sure, I'm just assuming it's demand driven. I mean, suppose some place they want something in health. And there is an Indian innovation that could do brilliantly there. We're just trying to understand what is the model that you think would work, considering you guys have worked. It's amazing how little we know about each other in this subcontinent. I mean, that's one of the first thing I realized when two years later I came to India and I started exploring. I was, you know, looking at Omidyar, what they're doing, and this and that. 
So, and same thing, I, we started this frugal innovation forum. Our Indian and Pakistani counterpart came in, and a lot of people didn't know about BRAC, and they saw, we took them to the field, and they were thrilled. So, first thing is that there were some systemic issues. Incredibly difficult to get visas uh, to Pakistan, India. I have not been able to get visas in Pakistan, for example. <laughs> so it's, and suddenly, for example, last three, four years, Indian visa has been easier in, in Bangladesh, and that has started a lot of exchanges as well. But I think that's one of the first thing is that, so one thing we have done where within our innovation lab is, uh, last year, one of the theme was that scaling simple solutions that works, and how the South Asian uh, upper, uh, NGOs who have successfully scaled, what were the essentials? Uh, of the scaling, because everybody asks that same question. What is the secret of scaling? So we formed a learning network amongst us. There's in Pakistan, there's RSPN who's involved, India, there's Pratham, there's a couple of other, Gram Vikas, a couple of other organizations involved. And we have done a lot of learning visits amongst ourselves. Uh, so go to see the programs and try to codify some of these things. And that is, I mean, that is one form. I mean, I'm not saying that this is, this is certainly has started a lot of conversation around scaling, what works in what context, which innovations can be replicated, and how you, and, and I think when these forums are good for a starting point, you meet people, you greet people, exchange cards, but then you take some people, like you were saying, that needs leadership to take it forward and partnership, and if you're really curious about how the other people have done it, and you, a lot of things have happened since the forum, uh, amongst this learning forum. So uh, I think once that happens, then you have a very specific themed uh, partnerships conversation. It's much more focused and narrowed down. And I think that's where the real value addition starts to happen. And, and a lot of us learn from each other and apply it to wherever we're working, and, and I think as the information flow has started, the visits have started, it's, it's getting better, but there's a lot to be done. I, I will take the example of Pakistan and Asir, for example. Mm. We wanted it, so we went out there. We took all regulations of both Safa and ICA. Um, uh, we just came through the cross border, and it happened. It was very organic, uh, very much, you know, it, it, as I said, it resonated with both partners. Um, we uh, didn't have a problem bringing government on board. Every ASAR launch, there's someone or the other from here uh, who comes there. Um, no question has ever been asked that, oh my God, this is an Indian product. God knows what's there. There's a conspiracy out there, or I'm an Indian agent, or whatever. So we have been able to stare off that. On a, uh, on a you know, being DFID and saying government to government, forget it because you'll have to go through so many and end up losing your credibility as well because the public sector is going is very tough. So it's better to have uh, people who will become your uh, inter ambassadors. And actually, the, our high commissioner loves the work we are doing because they say you're a better ambassador than us. At least you get on with it. Now, and I actually jokes apart, this is a very a strategic way of handling. Even Avishkar, who was in Pakistan recently, and they're looking for doing work in, in Pakistan, we are very happy to facilitate that. And so look for mediators, look for people who, are, who have a credibility, uh, people who will be able to work with the public sector also, and are sensible about you know, these relationships, because that's important, because scale is important, and it's important for lots of believers to you know, be brought together. Uh, I, th I think so it's a mature act, but it's also a, a, a very, as I said, a, an act which requires consistent approaches over time. Um, mapping so ecosystems of social enterprises across Pakistan and Bangladesh. So that's something that has been British Council funded, will come out in a couple of months. So hopefully that's something that could be useful for taking this discussion forward. Um, but one thing I wanted to comment on was that we haven't really touched on the fact that there's a lot of stuff bum bubbling underneath the surface in Pakistan and Banglada Bangladesh now. I mean, the organizations you represent are quite big, but there's a lot of individual social enterprises out there doing some innovative stuff. They may be small, 
but they're doing interesting stuff. There's accelerators coming up. There may just be one or two in each country, but they're there. They're trying to do things. And yes. I think that's also something that I think um, we should touch upon in the fact that it's really emerging now and there's ecosystems in each country emerging. And yes. It's not only about bringing what exists in India, but it's about let's build on what's popping up and is in that particular context. Um, and so my follow-on question there is, you know, for entities that are as big as BRAC, for instance, how are you going to support these emerging ecosystem enablers without swallowing them up within your own organization? No, I think basically what we have started to, that's one of the things that we have done in uh, uh, this frugal innovation forum that we are making it an annual event bringing all the players, helping them connect back and forth. And also the other thing is Brax University has a business school, and that's where we are kind of starting up an incubation fund as well for, uh, it's part of the ecosystem to fund various initiatives that, uh, you know, was the VC model, but which is not that present right now in Bangladesh. Um, but also I think a lot of, there are some capacity issues as well, and I think we have developed a center for entrepreneurship development within BRAC Business School that is emerging. It's not fully there uh, active yet, but our goal is to provide a lot of like the training that you mentioned uh, 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 in a large scale uh, and also provide some of these ac basic access to finance in various forms, whether it's loans or whether it's through VC capital. Uh, so that's how we want to help this space going forward. I thought I'll just comment, since we all said that we don't know each other, et cetera, and we are in the same region. I was the commander in the Indian Naval Submarine Arm for the last 20 years. I mean, in the Navy, and I retired as a commander. We were ready to, I mean, like Pakistanis and all, we have a concept that we should be killing each other and destroying each other. Most. Bangladesh Naval officers used to study along with us. Uh, when we meet outside in a diplomatic forum, I was just telling one of my friends also, you remove the uniform of tell them to criticize their admiral, their own admiral, or their own general, even best to criticize your own politician, you will not be able to identify who is who. That is a kind of inherent bonding that we all have. We just don't realize it. So if you meet each other and do something, we will kick. There's no doubt about it. shifting towards Asia. I mean, the historic model has been, you know, the global north has led and we kind of followed. I, I, think, I think that is changing now. And so, the, so uh, there's a lot of cooperation happening. This is an incredibly exciting space. So what you guys are doing, actually, what we all are doing, can significantly take the leadership in this space as well. And in others fact, will there's an, kind of an overt, there is a policy which is there for track two, track three. And this is very much in that realm. And that happens, you know, Aao Dosti Kare, Saradon Ke Paar, you name it, it's all happening in the name of, you know, this, precisely this. Everybody's bursting with enterprise, with dialogue, uh, with creating ecosystems even across borders and working very well from that, coming up with solutions in finance or learning or whatever or health, uh, water and so on. So I think, you know, I think we're all ready and poised. Um, many ideas, I mean, I've been so excited since yesterday, always am, but uh, I think, you know, so much of it can happen and go, go scale up for this region, which is phenomenal, but, you know, uh, perhaps for that reason, the official boundaries become higher and higher, but as far as people to people are concerned, you're talking about admirals, Look at the shopkeepers across borders. You know, the kind of loan facilities that go across. People come to buy, they say, don't worry, send your five lakhs or two millions later, and vice versa in Pakistan also. So they run these large uh, accounts, you know, in the markets um, and welcome each other, you know, so amazingly. So I think there's a, there's a very good, uh, there's a feel-good atmosphere going around in all these regions. We just need to do more of this 
where regions can be represented. I am very happy to be the only Pakistani here um, at this forum. Background. I mean, we have been traveling a bit in, uh, in these three or four South Asian countries, and we've got Do Doma Fund, which is uh, looking at Nepal. So there is a lot going on in the ecosystem, and uh, I, mean, I agree. You know that uh, uh, the the accelerators that uh, Lena was referring to. There's a few that are there in, in, in Bangladesh. There's certainly a few in Pakistan, and there's also a couple of them coming up in uh, in Sri Lanka. So in many, I think, in our limited experience of you know, nine, nine, ten months uh, at the Vishwar looking at these geographies, what we're finding is that the challenges are reasonably similar. And uh, if I can say this, similar to what India experienced maybe like a decade ago, or you know, 10, 15 years ago, in terms of when uh, Vishwar and Telecap were started, uh, there were very few sort of, sort of things going on over here. And uh, I think it's also a question of a larger entrepreneurial energy ecosystem. That once, uh, or, or, or entrepreneurial energy, which then brings in the ecosystem. So as more young people get involved in entrepreneurship overall, and the entrepreneurial sort of drive kicks in, like we did in India, many people in uh, these countries have said, for example, that what we need is a uh, Narayan Murti of, uh, of uh, Sri Lanka or something. Someone in Sri Lanka mentioned this. The minute you have a success story, a lot of young people want to get into entrepreneurship. And the ecosystem sort of, sort of comes around. And as far as the political instability, I think all of these countries sort of have uh, their fair share of political challenges. So I wouldn't say necessarily that it's better or worse in the other if you want to go. So uh, I'm from Doma Fund. Doma Fund is the first uh, equity investment, any kind of equity investment fund in Japan. So talking about integration, uh, we Learned a lot from uh, you know uh, from like Avishkar, Leopard. Uh, the main reason behind that is you know, uh, you know being the first one, we are doing a lot of regulatory work. You know, being the first one, there's no uh, you know, regulation to uh, regulate equity funds. You know, when we are talking to our regulators, uh, what we show them is the benchmarking from South Asia. So what mm -hmm. is happening in Sri Lanka? What is happening in India? So you know, uh, what is happening in Bangladesh, for example? So. Um, this is definitely, I think, you know, this is definitely integrating uh, the, the broader, you know, economic uh, mm. outcome of uh, the South Asian uh, country. Uh, also, what is happening is, like, in this forum, I want to make this quick, uh, quick comment is that we learn more from, you know, like, con uh, countries from uh, Cambodia, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, than, in, uh, than from India, mainly because of the you know, issue of uh, the size. Uh, you mm. know, the, the, the whole idea about like, you know, repl replicating business model. You know, it's, yeah, sure, like, you know, uh, there are a lot of good uh, business model coming out of India, but, you know, like, the issue of scale is always there. Just wanted to make that point. Okay. And I just wanted to also share very quickly that the public sector generally states, so any event we have, the public sector, you know, from the state bank to the ministries to everybody is sitting there and say, please go ahead, Bela, and organize this. Because if you go through us, this will take forever. So we are very happy to come and learn and, you know, see what's happening and, and you know, also encourage you as an enabling body. There is, so therefore, you know, one has to look at that as well. And also, the government itself is very afraid of its own role as a regulator. They know there's corruption, they know they don't do a good job, they go know the gag enterprise. So, you know, the government is very self-critical as well and therefore allows its partners to be able to become facilitators. With that, I think uh, we have reached uh, the end of our time. I, I think uh, with that, I'd like to great uh, round of applause to all our panelists. Thank you.